Questions of Doom. Hello and welcome back to another Questions of Doom. In this series, as ever, I attempt to answer questions that you send my way using the archaeosoup at gmail.com email address, as displayed on the YouTube channel homepage, but also, as you'll see, at the end of this video. In answering these questions by video, it is my hope that the answer is not only useful to the person who has asked the question, but also anyone else out there who may be wondering the same thing. Now, today's question is actually a quandary which has faced many an archaeologist over the years, indeed most archaeologists, and that is the quandary of context sheets. Uh, this, the question goes like this. Dear Mr. Soup, context sheets, dot dot dot. Explain, explain. There it says in, in brackets, Dalek voice. Explain! Explain! <laughs> Yours sincerely, DokiFan94. Well, DokiFan, you ask a question, uh, as I say, which is near universal. Almost all of us have struggled with context recording sheets at one point or another in our professional careers. Now, um, before we get to that, let's just uh, take a moment to consider the importance of context recording. As many archaeologists repeat, um, indeed as I have said before, archaeology is the unrepeatable experiment. Every excavation essentially, usually, destroys uh, the, the, the archaeology in question, or, or certainly the context of the archaeology. Um, as you're excavating, you're actually destroying what's around, for example, a find that you might make, and therefore you're losing the information uh, about where that find was found. So during this process, the best thing to do is to try and record as much as possible about every single element of the site, every single context of that site, and uh, in order to build up essentially a series of units which you can use to, to date things and essentially build up a chronology. This context came before that one, therefore it's probably older than the one ab uh, above it, that kind of thing. Now, um, this uh, means that you are often faced with a context sheet when you arrive on an excavation. Uh, every unit, every uh, country, um, sorry, and then therefore every region and therefore every unit uh, probably uses a slightly different context sheet, and indeed I know they do. Um, and um, I have taken the liberty of actually constructing my own context sheet because each unit usually owns the rights to their particular way of recording information. So what I've done is I've actually collated various um, types of information, or rather various types of context sheets, into one from my experience, and um, this uh, will cover probably a basic form format for a, co for a context sheet. Now what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this sheet together. If you want to have a look at it, um, feel free to go to the link in the information bar below. When you get there, click on, uh, there's a little, when you hover over the, over the sheet uh, with your mouse, a little arrow will appear just at the top right hand corner. Click on that, it should expand and you'll be able to see the letters more clearly, just in case you're having any trouble. Now then, let's uh, begin the process. But before we do begin this process of looking through the sheet, it's important that I put on my hard hat. Yes. So, <laughs> at the top, Archaeosuit Productions Sample Context Recording Sheet. Then you'll notice uh, just below that, in the, uh, the top left, grid reference. Well, that's simply whereabouts on the site the this particular context is uh, is to be found. Um, essentially, usually, an excavation is divided up into a grid, uh, kind of like a chessboard, and you can identify each of those squares using uh, often, for example, uh, I don't know, five uh, north, uh, six east, or maybe um, uh, an alphanumeric system, so maybe 5b, this kind of thing. And that will give you um, the, the grid reference for your context, so you make a note of it there. Next, you'll see site name. Well, that's simply the name of the place where you're doing your excavating. And this, for example, if, it's, if you're excavating on Rose Hill Farm in the South Paddock, you may well call it Rose Hill Farm South Paddock. Then there's the site code. This is a code which you assign to the site in order that all the data from this site can be uh, essentially tagged to this excavation. It's always got the site code and therefore you know where it's come from. Um, the site code for Rose Hill Farm South Paddock may, may well be RHF uh, SP12, because it's being dug in 2012 or maybe even 11-12, uh, is being dug in November. Uh, next to that, you'll see the context number. That's the number of the context that you're trying to record, or that you're wanting to record. Um, this will be uh, based upon the other contexts in the excavation. They usually, they usually develop in a, a sequential order, and you should know that number, so, or at the very least one of your colleagues will be able to give it to you. And then next to that, you have job number. 
And usually job number is only really used by um, a commercial archaeology unit. So uh, those who usually are being hired by a named um, a customer or client who is paying directly for this excavation to take place, often before a building project occurs. So uh, this will help you link the excavation to the client and also it's useful, for example, for invoicing purposes and this kind of thing. So the job number goes there, but not on all excavations. Next, uh, we're actually into the meat, essentially, of recording the context. So, you can either record a deposit, um, a positive context, or a cut, a negative context. Now, uh, the deposit context, um, you're asked to describe several things, uh, including the compaction, colour and composition of the context. Now, this usually applies to, um, to soil contexts. A stone, for example, or, or maybe a wall, um, will actually um, usually just be described in terms of what it looks like and probably what type of rock it is. But when you're talking about the compaction, it's basically how dense the soil is, how, uh, what the, the, the makeup of the soil is, the, the, the size or the, the uniform, uh, uniformity. I guess, oh, uh, or the uh, you know whether or not all the different molecules and, and elements of the of the soil um, are are uniform in size and shape, or whether or not they're made up of different sizes, pieces or lumps. Um, the composition it could be friable, it could be it could break apart between your th fingers and thumb, quite dry. It could be, for example, laminated. It could be lots of thin little layers, often laid down, for example, by silt by, or through a, a floodplain, through a river. Uh, those you know, these are all words which you can use to describe the context. And often the colour will actually be described using a Munsell chart, not unlike, uh, unlike rather a paint chart when you're choosing uh, paint for, to, for maybe to paint your bedroom or something. And you'll have a whole selection of colours, but in this case uh, it's a Munsell chart, and usually it'll range from sort of brown through to red, yellow, most possibly into grey. And you can choose on that chart what the colour of this particular deposit is most like. It'll be a number or maybe a word, like for example burnt umber, that kind of thing. Uh, there's inclusions, that's uh, inclusions less than 10%, it says, and, and they are um, elements of the context which are alien to that context, but nonetheless have, have been, I suppose, included in it. They usually make up less than 10% of the context, and can be anything from, for example, uh, flakes from tool making, maybe little bits of uh, flakes of flint, uh, to uh, shells, possibly. Someone's been eating a meal and has thrown shells into the context. They could even be um, the remnants of woodworking, or possibly even actually metalwork, maybe bits of slag. But you'll make note of that in this section um, on the deposit. And then finally, uh, dimensions and discussion. So you measure the context, you, you, uh, you make sure you, you do a good job of that because it's important, uh, and then you discuss it a little bit. Uh, this, is, this is an opportunity to begin, I suppose, your interpretation. You're actually discussing what it is that you're looking at. What is this context? What is it made up of? Uh, what is its nature, I suppose? And that's what you're discussing there. If you're recording a, a cut or a negative context, I suppose, then that's what you do in the next box. Here, you can, um, you're asked to make note of the shape in plan. Now often, uh, for example, a cut will be a ditch, so it, it could be a very acute ditch, it could be like a V-shape, uh, it could be a fairly um, oblique kind of thing, it could be a fairly soft ditch, which is sort of almost like curvy. It could be actually poorly defined, you might not really be able to see where one context really ends and another one begins. And all of these things are things that you're asked to draw and also make, uh, make a note of. So for example, the shape of the plan, uh, sorry, in plan rather, and also the corners and you have to describe. And again, these, you'll be given a fairly standard vocabulary to explain these things. Often they're in a site manual. Everything from, for example, with the deposits, the, the nature of the soil, things like words like friable, it'll, it'll tell you what that means. Therefore, everyone will know when you use this standard vocabulary what you're referring to in this information. Um, but also when it comes to the cuts, um, again, similarly, often there are standardised words in your unit which will help you to communicate what it is that you're looking at. And ultimately that's what all of this is about. It's about helping you later on, but also your colleagues and the site supervisor perhaps, to, to get uh, an understanding of what it is that you've excavated. And the best way to do that is to use a standardised vocabulary. Um, dimensions and depth you're asked to record, again, measuring. The orientation, or the alignment, as some people might call it, that's essentially which way is it facing? Is it east, west, north, south? This can often be very important in the, in the case of uh, grave cuts, for example. It can instantly tell you something about a person's belief system, or rather the belief system of the people who did the burying, at the very least. Um, filled by, that's number six, well, uh, so number five, rather. That's um, if your cut is filled by other contexts, uh, usually positive ones, one, or more contexts, then you can make a note of that, a quick note saying, well, this context number 
uh, 502 was filled by context 503, 504 and 505, this kind of thing. Uh, and then other comments, so um, number six there, you can comment on, uh, you know, again, the impressions, you're beginning to form an impression of that context. So uh, you may well say, well this cut is quite possibly a drainage ditch, or it could be uh, possibly accidental, it may well actually simply be where a stone or something has been knocked and dragged for a little bit through the ground. Uh, this may be the reason why it's poorly defined in terms of its edges, so it's an opportunity for you to begin to describe those features. Now next down, on the left hand side there, you will see interpretation and you're asked to please circle internal, external, structural or other. Now uh, this, as it, as, it, as it says on the tin I suppose, is simply you starting to talk about what you think this is, the, what, what is the interpretation of your context. Is it internal? Is it from inside a structure? Is it external? Is it from outside a structure? Is it structural? Is it part of a structure? <laughs> uh, or is it other? Um, if, for example, it could be a series of stones defining maybe a small garden patch, something like that, where it's neither internal, really, it's not, uh, it's not external, it's not really defined, it, although it is defining a space, and it's not really a structure, it's more, well, other. So you circle other. And then you can, you can talk a little bit about what it is you think it is, based upon uh, your description of the, of the context. And then also you're invited here to sketch a plan or section uh, on the reverse of the sheet. Now to the right there you can see stratigraphic matrix and nine boxes. And this is a chance for you to, to start to place your context into the context of a, um, a Harris matrix or a, a sort of, well, stratigraphic matrix. Essentially, you're locating it in relation to other contexts. If you want to know what a Harris matrix is, uh, I won't go into it here, but check out uh, the link which will be below, along with the link to this, uh, to this particular sheet, um, and that will tell you a bit more about Harris matrices, as it were. But a Harris matrix is essentially a tool for uh, putting contexts into a relationship with each other using numbers and a flowchart system. So you know uh, very quickly that uh, one context maybe contains three others and that these three relate uh, in a certain uh, order, or possibly maybe the bottom one relates to the top two fairly equally, and maybe the second one was you know, sort of in cut into the into the into the third one this kind of thing so it helps you to to understand that by, by essentially putting these things into a relationship usually the context that you're talking about will be the middle one the one that you're recording and then you can uh, put other contexts into the relationship with that box by signaling and connecting them with lines and this kind of thing so anyway check out that link for more uh, next fines you have to please tick uh, any fines that you made in your context you can uh, say none I found nothing uh, there's pot, fairly straightforward pottery, glass, uh, CBM, that's ceramic building material, uh, that could be uh, tiles, roof tiles, internal tiles, it could even be brick actually, and um, CBM can be, uh, or rather brick can be classed as CBM. Uh, burned flint, oh, is there any burned flint? Flint which is, has been exposed to fire. Struck flint, the result maybe of making tools, uh, or a tool itself. Uh, metal, bone, wood, leather. Other, so that's something else which isn't defined here, and then other BM, so that's something else which you think may actually be part of a structure, but uh, maybe not entirely sure, but it doesn't uh, deserve its own you know, classification, so you're actually just saying other BM. You tick that, and it's, it's a, an interesting question to answer in a moment or two, or in a few days. And um, Now, to the right of that, you see fill, and you're asked to tick whether or not it has been sieved. That is, the, I suppose, the, the, the spoil from your, from your context when it starts to be excavated. Um, whether, has it been sieved on site, or will it be sieved on site or off site? And also a metal detector. Has it been passed over the spoil heap? This is, the, the, again, the, the lump of stuff that you take out of the ground, um, on site or off site. You're asked to confirm that with a tick. Below finds, you'll see samples, um, and you have to make a note of sample numbers and type. Now, samples could be anything, uh, really, from um, establishing envir the environment. So, for example, maybe uh, some plant matter which has been uncovered for, and has gone off for analysis. You're asked to make a, a note of the type of sample and the number. You'll be given the number, hopefully, by the person who's taken the sample. Um, or it could, it could also actually be um, a sample to try and um, establish a carbon date. Maybe you found something which you think could be carbon dated. And again, that's a sample which is taken away and you're given a number which you can refer to here so that it can be linked to this context. You see, it's all about interlinking information. Below that, additional information, uh, a photo format and shot numbers. Now, in the olden days, you'd be asked to give a, a film reel number, as it were, and also the photograph numbers on that reel. 
uh, but not really anymore. Usually it's, a, it's a, uh, a digital photo, probably a memory card, so the memory card A, and then photos number one, two, and three, because these days obviously photos are usually numbered by the camera itself. Um, and also plans and drawing numbers. If anyone has uh, drawn a plan, if you've drawn a plan, maybe top down using a grid, you can make reference to the, to the, the number of that plan and link it to the sheet essentially by making a note of it in this section at the bottom. Uh, highest and lowest level. Well, you establish the highest and lowest level of your context using essentially a surveying technique. Uh, a theodolite uh, is used. What you do is you um, essentially, it's like a telescope, which is um, given, uh, you establish its height above sea level by using usually a local ordnance survey datum point. These are sort of um, little T-shapes with, um, I suppose, extra legs, as it were. Um, and they are located all over the place, especially in, in places like Britain. And you can establish from that well, that's X many thousand feet above sea level, therefore my theodolite is uh, two more feet than that. And using that, you know precisely, if you use a ranging pole, which is a red and white stick, um, how high above sea level your context is, the bottom and the top of it. You simply have to move the stick up and down, get someone to, to, to note that off. And you can make a note of that here. So above sea level, highest and lowest point of your context. Um, then you're asked finally to date and time it. Uh, often you don't actually have to put the time, but sometimes you do. Um, name in capital, so it's easily read by other folk. Um, checked by, so if you ask a colleague to check your work, make sure that all the boxes are filled in so that no information is missing. And then finally you and probably the person who signed it as well, or rather checked it as well, will sign it at the bottom where it says signature. And there you go. That is a context sheet. Um, they can be rather intimidating when you first look at them, and every single context sheet is different. So this one may have more than you're used to, or it may have less than you're used to. But by walking through a context sheet together, hopefully I've taken away some of the mystery. It's nothing more than a tool to, 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 to capture as much information from the process of excavation as is possible. Now, um, as I say, they may appear to be intimidating, and often, for example, an individual unit will have a slightly esoteric element, a, a, a bit which is only known to them. So, for example, I've come across um, context sheets where you're asked to tick um, in a particular section a certain symbol, maybe a cross, to, in, uh, to indicate that you think this is a ritual deposit, or maybe um, a, uh, an egg timer to indicate that you think it has been filled up slowly over time. But crucially, when you join a unit, or when you start excavating with um, other archaeologists in that unit, they'll always be happy to help you with your context sheet. If you have any questions, always ask. Because not only will they say, well, they may well say, <laughs> yes, I know, but also they'll um, be quite happy to explain what exactly is going on. Um, because ultimately you're helping yourself and you're helping them by uh, being as accurate as is possible. Uh, because ultimately, the more accurate the data, the more uh, useful the results, and the more useful the results, uh, the more um, uh, well, the more accurate and the more uh, right and true uh, the, the overall interpretation of the excavation. And that's usually what uh, this is all about. It's about producing a report, either, for example, uh, maybe some grey literature for um, uh, a company who wants to build in a certain area, or um, it's about uh, producing um, other things, such as, for example, an academic um, uh, work on a site. Maybe you're adding to a body of research, and therefore, again, the data has to be accurate. So the context sheet, though a mass of boxes and things to be filled in, it's not as bad as you might think. And, um, and ultimately, once you get the hang of it, usually you can do them rather quickly. So yeah, there you go, context sheets. Thank you so much for asking the question, Doki fan. I have enjoyed immensely answering this question. And ultimately, actually, I've enjoyed making my own context sheet um, in a slightly geeky way. <laughs> Geeks here at Archeo Soup Towers? Surely not. Well, yes, I mean, I'm a little bit of a geek. Um, but there you go, so context sheets. Now, if you have any stories or thoughts that you'd like to share about your experiences of context sheets, maybe you moved from one unit to another and you had a problem getting used to the new context sheet, please do feel free to share below um, because I'm sure Doki fan would love to hear. There you go. So, uh, until next time, guys, um, stay safe. And also, uh, once again, never um, uh, feel uh, remotely ashamed to ask questions because, frankly, the more questions you ask, uh, well, the less mistakes you'll make. So there you go. That's the lesson of the day. So until next time, take care. Bye-bye.